Uh, welcome to part 3D <laughs> of uh, the Letters to the Seven Churches. Uh, we're still in Pergamum, which was uh, kind of where Satan spent a lot of time. Uh, and we're going to work on dwelling and dueling with devils, particularly the spiritual armor uh, in this session um, and, and how to use it. Uh, we saw that Ephesus had left its first love. They needed to repent or they would lose out. Uh, and then we got to Smyrna, where uh, Satan's agents were um, you know, slandering believers, uh, but they overcame him uh, by the blood of their lamb. Of the lamb. And uh, God lets Satan uh, have what looks like free reign uh, in the lives of believers. And uh, the church in Northern Africa was actually wiped out. Uh, it, the church itself isn't always victorious, but individual believers can be victorious even if they are martyred. Um, so when we went to Revelation, and, and now we're in Pergamon. <clears throat> Look at this last week. Uh, Jesus says he knows that they dwell where Satan's throne is. Uh, and that they hold fast his name and have not denied faith in him, even when one of the chief saints was killed among them where Satan dwells. So he's, this is like Satan dwells, Satan dwells. Uh, he, he knows that that is uh, the pinnacle of Satan's power uh, at that time in history. So we looked about how the whole world's under the control of the uh, evil one. And... Uh, we got all the way through this until uh, we got to the armor passage is where I left off. So I just want to re-emphasize this verse. You're going to see it a couple times more. The key to victory in the Christian life is submitting to God. Um, and uh, otherwise, you can't draw upon his power. He doesn't give you the grace you need. You're left to yourself. And... Uh, the immature, carnal believer with a worldly mindset uh, is the fault of being dumb. Uh, they just are unaware of what's going on, and most churches do not teach this. Uh, and as a result, they're deceived by Satan, and they wind up doing Satan's will, and they believe it is God's will. Because they haven't done the work of sanctifying their minds, their values, and their desires. They really have disobeyed the command to take heed to yourself and think about why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, in dealing with Satan, uh, we're tempted to just think because Satan works through people, that people are the problem. Uh, yeah, people are a problem, but the power behind them is the real problem. So the weapons of uh, the warfare uh, are not of the world. Uh, if you want divine power, you, that is going to demolish the strongholds that Satan builds in people's lives. Uh, you need God's power to do that. And strongholds is really, it's like a fortress. And uh, in, over the years, I've become more convinced that people are really entrenched in uh, God's, I mean, in Satan's uh, world. And they he does not yield easily. The person might want to yield. In fact, there are people who have escaped the corruption that's in the world through their lust, but then they are ensnared again, Jude says, because of bad teaching. So uh, what we have to do as believers in helping each other uh, succeed in a Christian life and please God is tear down the arguments and every presumption that's set up against the knowledge of God. And then personally, we need to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Um, and Paul said he was going to turn people over to Satan when he got there. If they did not repent. And the end result of church discipline is to do that for the destruction of the flesh that their spirit might be saved on the day of Christ. So finally, at the end of Ephesians, uh, he uh, is talked about uh, how the body lives in unity uh, and some correctives to how Satan tries to disrupt that unity in chapters 4 and 5. And the biggie is you need to submit to one another in the fear of God. And then he gives the exceptions uh, to the mutual submission principle, 
there is a hierarchy because three examples of the hierarchy uh, a fourth one that's not there is that uh, it's like five or so verses in scripture where it talks about a spiritual hierarchy actually even more but then he says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might right we need his power to fight uh, an adversary that is spiritual and then he says you need protective armor and the thing that you need it for is to be able to stand against the schemes the wiles the strategies of the devil stand uh, the whole point is to stand having done all to stand it's not talking about it's also, you know, storming the gates of hell with a water pistol but it's to stand in the unity that God has created and you need the spiritual armor to do this because our battle isn't really against flesh and blood but it's against principalities powers rulers of darkness against spiritual wickedness in high places you'll see this two or three times in this outline um, so you need the whole armor because any place you're unprotected uh, is uh, a place where Satan can get you and if you don't have the whole armor on and you're not protected and you're not in the battle formation that God's mandated uh, Satan will get you uh, a number of years ago I, I think it was probably part of the myth myth busters I'm not sure if they did it or uh, it was a spin-off from that but they had matchups of warriors of the past and they kind of assign values to their their weapons their strategies um, at that point I was uh, probably a fan of the ninjas be winning because they were, you know, were really good uh, but the final showdown was between the ninjas and samurais they went out uh, uh, you know, uh, Indians uh, you know, American Indians they went out real fast uh, the uh, people that actually won against the ninjas with all their tricks uh, were the Romans because they had big shields uh, being protected is the key to longevity in battles uh, of course now it's having good artillery backing you up but uh, and we'll talk about maybe some of the battles a little later so you need the whole armor to stand withstand stand so then he's going to start with and this is just a preview of it uh, having your loins girded with truth breastplate of righteousness feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace those are boots that had studs on the bottom of them so they wouldn't lose their footing and in addition to all take up the shield of faith so uh, I've been watching uh, over the past year or two uh, off and on a series called the Vikings and uh, they are also people who fight like the Romans fought and they're very fierce fighters they overlap their shields and uh, the there are guys that stand behind the shields with bows and arrows who you know, pick off the enemy you know they jump up and shoot them back 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 down and uh, you know they're fiery darts so arrows that are on fire are kind of really effective because they can start burning your shield and if you get hit by them you're in trouble uh, and then you got the helmet of salvation to protect your head this is the one piece that it doesn't uh, specifically mentioned earlier in the book you mentioned salvation but uh, Thessalonians has a good reference which we'll get to in a minute and then the only offensive weapon is the sword of the spirit which is the word of God uh, as I watch the Vikings fight uh, would have been nice if they had spears I can no longer reach uh, but the sword, the sword was where they did most of their uh, destruction and then one part of the body that was not protected was uh, what's called the greaves uh, that's knee pads and that's because you're supposed to be praying uh, and the prayer is petition for all the saints uh, and we'll look at that a little down below so as I was doing this I realized oh yeah I've already got this down somewhere so I, I went hunting on truthbase uh, and uh, truthbase.net and I could not find the sermon on this passage uh, so I said, okay, I'll just you know, go to Daily Truth. It's like the, the way it was, it, it didn't show up when I did the Google searches, nor the search bar within the, the program uh, or the yeah, the site. Uh, but on Daily Truth Base, uh, I had referenced it. 
so the real battle of spiritual warfare. That's another whole sermon. It doesn't have uh, video, but it does have audio. I did it in 2006, uh, and my understanding of the process has not changed in all those years. It's just been validated. Uh, probably if you go back and listen to what I said then, I'd have different illustrations. Uh, but I have over the past, well, from over 2006 is to now, uh, 14 years, 15, 16 years, um, you know, just seen more and more how true it is that people who uh, fail at the Christian life uh, have been taken down by Satan because they haven't uh, armed themselves properly. So from Daily Truth Base, having concluded the parenthetical section occasioned by the climactic call for mutual submission of body members to each other in the fear of the Lord, he now directs his instruction to corporate spiritual warfare. All right, the parenthetical section is engendered by the call for mutual submission. Submit yourselves to one another in the fear of God. It's you know, in chapter 5. And then he talks about three hierarchical relationships. Uh, wives submit to husbands, uh, slaves to masters, and children to parents. He addresses the subordinate person in each thing first, the responsibilities that the uh, superior, for lack of a better word, uh, person has as well. But uh, it's now he's kind of concluded that. And now he's going to talk about a unified body, how they stand against Satan's attacks to disrupt that unity. According to the purpose of God and the work of Christ, the Holy Spirit constituted the assembly of believers into the body of Christ under Christ's headship. He is the chief shepherd. Uh, any elder is just a you know, under shepherd. Uh, thus the body becomes the temple in which God's glory could be manifested to the world. First uh, Peter 2 does a really good job on this, talking about the living stones being built together. But they're only that temple in this age as they live in unity. Uh, that's how the glory is manifested in the church. Also in the age to come, they will the world will see God's glory. Uh, the, the principalities and powers, and, you know, the bad devil, the devils. Uh, we'll see his glory when he pours out his blessings of glory upon the believers who followed Christ's commands. Uh, for reasons discussed briefly under digging deeper in the post on 2 Corinthians 5, I kind of go back to Adam and Eve, what they lost, and uh, how it's regained in Christ, and you, you can find that post if you want it. Satan doesn't want unity to be maintained, and will do everything in his devious power to disrupt it, as church history so sadly demonstrates. Uh, we're talking about people visiting Amsterdam, and uh, one of the spots uh, to, is their red light district, which is notorious uh, throughout Europe, and uh, in the center of it is one of the, the oldest church in Amsterdam. <laughs> so right at that spot where people were being rescued uh, from uh, Satan's clutches, uh, you know, the, Satan has actually built up a um, you know, their trap uh, for destroying people's lives. Uh, the battle the church faces is not against flesh and bloods, although many of Satan's agents are humans taken captive to his will. That's second. That's I mean, Second Timothy two at the very end of that chapter. Um, believers are taken captive to do his will. Look it up if you don't believe it. Uh, our real battle is against the demonic forces of Satan, who controls individuals. He controls rulers. He controls governments. Back in the day, it was like Assyria and Babylon. Uh, then you could see it happening like the Nazis and uh, some of the stuff that's probably going on in Europe today and even in our country. You, you just can't explain how countries can be destroyed by people. You know, you actually see it in Asia. Um, it, it's like it doesn't make sense. And whenever I see things that don't make sense, I realize that Satan's involved. Uh, so you, you see it in our age. The warfare paired. Paul describes in this chapter is corporate, not individual. So whenever you see someone talking about these individual pieces of armor and they see a piece and then they start, you know, rap, right. they, 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 they just don't know the book. They, they haven't read it. They're just parroting something someone else said. Uh, so there is a series on truthbase.net for individual defense against dark arts. And then this real battle is actually, I put the outline down below uh, for your edification.
Satan's goal is to destroy the temple. And you might recall uh, Solomon built the greatest temple in the world. And because of your disobedience, uh, God basically caused it to be burned. I've been going through uh, Second Chronicles, and I, I keep going back because the, the names are really hard to remember. And from like chapter 20, they got this phenomenal deliverance where it took three days to bring all the spoil in, and they didn't have to do anything. And God raises up these kings and blesses them, and then when the kings are you know, kind of comfy, they, they go bad. And repeatedly, uh, and then they, they do things like they uh, lock the doors to the temple. Uh, after God has given them the victory, uh, they take this stuff out of the temple and uh, give it to, to the pagans, and they start worshiping Baal and you know Asherah poles and all, all this other stuff. It's unbelievable. They don't mention Satan in these passages, but w when you kind of look at it in the whole picture, you see that he is very actively destroying churches. That's why so many denominations have gone bad. Um, it, it's, he's actively doing it. Uh, it's it's amazing. One king that started out really good. He's like in chapter oh, 25 or so. Um, actually starts going to attack the Lord's enemies. And uh, he goes and defeats. God gives him the victory. God makes it really clear that he's the one who's giving the victory. And he, he basically had hired other people. And God said, don't use them. If you use them, you'll lose. But just go with what you got. And I'll make it up to you. And... Uh, you can win. I think that's chapter 25. The guy goes and defeats his enemies, 10,000 of them he kills, and then he takes another 10,000 captive. They throw him off a, a cliff to, to kill him. Uh, and then he takes the gods of the people he defeated, brings them back, and replaces uh, Yahweh worship with the pagan worship. And those gods couldn't protect the people he just destroyed. It's like, how can you be that stupid? Um, he, Satan blinded him. So, Satan destroys churches. He destroys people to do, destroy the churches. Uh, he doesn't want God's glory to be displayed nor given to faithful saints. Remember, that's what he grasped at and lost. So, the corrective is to stand in unity. And having done all, just like the book says, stand. Stand is mentioned four times. The emphasis is defensive. It's not about charging the gates of hell with a water pistol, which is a good way to become toast. But it's about the most successful military strategy known in the ancient world called the phalanx. Uh, if you saw the movie Troy, I think it's Troy, and they say, bring out the turtle. It, oh, 300? Uh, 300? All right, so it, it, it basically is a human tank, uh, and the armor on it are the uh, shields. And within that, they rotate so people don't get tired. They, they, they blow their whistle, and then they rotate so the people are front bearing the brunt of the enemy. Uh, slip back in and new guys or fresh guys are there and then they are fighting against a person who's getting tired because if you're beating on you know folks you get tired and they can you know, protect themselves from arrows uh, as soon as they drop their shields uh, people get uh, skewered so uh, a single well-trained array of hoplites or foot soldiers in a tight formation could stand against an invading horde and win uh, in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Josh McDowell says, um, he, he goes into a little more depth about the, the people who were guarding the tomb of Jesus. And he said, each of these guys were trained to defend uh, a three square foot area against an invading horde. You could put a line of these guys there and they would um, stand firm and they wouldn't get past. Uh, if, you know, when you're actually attacking someone, they would do it in a uh, hoplite formation or a uh, phalanx. Um, and when we watch the series on the Vikings, the battles are pretty realistic. Um, they aren't, so I've done research on them. Uh, they had good tactics, but then they have to have some people lose, so then they kind of give up the good tactics. And But the shield wall made the Vikings famous. Mm. And uh, it's, uh, you know, they, they could destroy forces three and four times their size. And then the one time you see them lose, they abandon that strategy. So uh, they weren't standing together fighting next to each other, just every man for themselves, and then they got skewered. Each one stood firm next to his fellow soldier, so the individuals worked as a unit to repel the attackers. So the uh, this works from you know the, the military strategy 
from the motivational uh, component, uh, what I repeatedly hear whenever I read articles about war is the reason people are fighting is not for the ideology, but for the guy next to them. Uh, they're looking out for each other, and that's what keeps them together, and that's what keeps them alive. If they broke ranks or separated, they become vulture food. Uh, it happens repeatedly. When you, know, you, when you fail to keep the discipline, you lose. Because, and that works in the animal world. Satan always picks off the people, who, not the people, the animals that break away from the herd. Okay, so this is a little maybe repetitive, what I said above, but I won't kill you to hear it twice. The weapons Paul describes are defensive, with the exception of the sword. Uh, Satan largely deploys lies to do his dirty work. So what's the best defense against lies? Truth. And Satan confuses truth. He causes people to doubt the truth, to misunderstand the truth, to forget the truth. Uh, truth is the best defense. Uh, so when you went to put on your armor, you had a belt that you put on around your waist. It's called girding your waist. And you hung your pieces of armor on that, chief being the breastplate that protected like your heart and lungs, things that are kind of useful for living. Um, so the best uh, defense is the uh, belt of truth. The best offense is the sword of the Spirit of God, which happens to be the Word of God, which happens to be truth as well. Truth is good for offense and defense. Now, this is a part that people miss because they don't study things in context. Each of the pieces of armor was referred to earlier in the book and are truths about the formation of the body as a temple of God. The thing that was causing their disruption was the egos of the Jews and the Gentiles. Each thought they were better than the others, and uh, it's the, there's separation. And he writes a letter to have these people that are believers live in the unity that God desires so the body can speak the truth and love to each other and grow. And we'll see that as we you know, get to the uh, uh, gospel of peace, this butt boots, but let's do this line here. Um, attached to the belt of truth was the blessed bed of righteousness, protecting their heart. And that's the righteous conduct of a renewed mind. That's how you get righteousness. Uh, and that winds up engaging in other-centered rather than self-centered behavior. You sacrifice yourself for each other. Jesus said there's no greater love than this, that you lay down your life for your friend. So that's something that should be characterizing uh, a biblical body of believers. The studded boots, so they had like little nails and spikes in the bottom, uh, like cleats almost, enable them to stand their ground uh, when the enemy pushed against them, was the good news of peace that God created between Jews and Gentiles. So we'll look at the verse in a few minutes. Jews and Gentiles are now one, effectively nullifying the lies that would cause the two groups to become factious, which would split the temple. Shield of faith enable them to tap into the supernatural power of God to live in love. We'll look at that in a minute. Helmet of salvation. Uh, so it protects your head. Uh, most battles are lost. Uh, they definitely get lost when your head gets chopped off. <laughs> but you, 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 when you think you're going to lose and you run or you succumb to fear, then you get routed. You turn and run from the enemy, and then you just they, they stab you in the back. They shoot you with arrows. They chase after you. You're separated. You're de you know, defenseless, and you get you know, slain. So the helmet of salvation, which protects their thinking, is clarified in uh, 1 Thess 5.8 as the hope of salvation. So the thing that really should be keeping our minds uh, focused on the right things is the fact that God will reward us for that. And as you all know, reward is not something that is uh, talked much about in churches. Um, oh, we're all equal. But it's talked about a lot in the scripture. So that's under digging deeper. Missing piece of equipment. Uh, this is like a summary statement of this, was the knee pads. Praying for the saints according to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Most people who are big on prayer are big on praying for themselves. Uh, and then they don't really, if they're praying for the saints, they kind of, and pray for all, bless our missionaries and you know, bless this and bless that. Uh, instead of actually having the Spirit tell them what he wants them to pray for. So the body puts on truth and keeps it. Uh, protecting them, the attacks of Satan can't harm them, and they will stand and succeed. 
Okay, uh, and it, this is just off Daily Truth Base. So, uh, Paul segues from instructing to pray for each other, asking prayer for himself, so he can proclaim the good news. Um, Paul wishes them peace. It's more harmony in this case. But the application I wanted to put in here. Believers need to draw on God's strength and truth to live in unity and withstand the onslaughts of Satan. Doing things independently, which is the essence of sin, is certain death, which is loss of dominion. Now, the reason why people can't you know, really live in unity is they don't know how to draw on God's strength and truth. Uh, Hebrews 4 talks about, uh, let's boldly come before the throne of grace that we may uh, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, the word boldly is in there. It, it's a word that talks about being able to speak freely because you have a uh, moral ground. Uh, so if you're not working on being sanctified, you know, you, you're not cleansed from your sin, uh, you, you're not going to be able to stand before God with any confidence to ask and receive. Prayer, God, thanks that you always provide all I need to do your will. Always. All we need to do his will. Not our will but his will. And then thanks for the like-minded believers who are intent on loyally loving you. So yeah, we heard about that in our praise time. Um, yeah, other believers uh, are essential for growth in the Christian life. Um, when I kind of started getting my act together, uh, I wasn't really fond of uh, other believers because I saw too many flaws. Um, and then I went to this, God put me at this conference uh, with the NAVs, um, I was my last semester of school, or almost at the at the end of my sixth and fifth, fifth and a half semester. And so I started starting my sixth one, but there was this conference, and uh, I was at had a work study program where I had a uh, I could fly anywhere for free. Uh, I had a friend who had a condo I could stay at for free. I think it was Park Cities, Utah, and I was really enjoyed skiing. So I was all into going out there because it would have been like the Alps where there's great skiing. And I was invited to this conference by a friend, actually someone I led to the Lord. And I said, oh, no, I'm going skiing. And then there's no snow, <laughs> no snow. How can there be no snow? There's always snow there. But that year there was no snow. So uh, I wound up going uh, to this uh, conference in Atlantic City instead of Park City, Utah. And uh, I wound up, the message, the first message was uh, the kind of man God uses. Um, I hardly, never used to buy books. Um, I guess once you want to read them, you don't need to read them again. But uh, I actually picked up a book at the book table called Disciples Are Made Not Born. And I, I hear this message about the kind of man God uses. I want it to be that kind of man. And I get back to my hotel room at night. I open up the book, and chapter one is the kind of man God uses. The different author. You know, it wasn't the same guy who wrote the book. Um, so I read through it, and I think I had like seven characteristics. And I get to the one that uh, you know basically was a you know, spotlight on my life. It was you know really bright. Uh, God does not use uh, independent people. He uses team players. So I prayed that God would send people into my life. And as I left the conference, I had this great job lined up uh, for my last semester, including a place to live. And then the pipes broke. And I, you know, once again, God thwarted my circumstances and I needed a place to live. And uh, that, that same friend said, hey, so-and-so was looking for a roommate. You'd really help him out if you did that. It turns out two of the guys doubled up so they could take me into their apartment. And uh, that kind of got me, uh, you know, on, I, I it was really useful for getting on the right track. And then God brought other people to my life in other years, particularly when I was at seminary. So, hey, Bill, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, just on the, like, the interdependence and how um, that kind of plays out with also recognizing God's giving people different works to do and different, like, skills and wirings. So how do those... How do those things kind of coexist? Just a conversation I've been having recently of kind of being aware of the, the good works that, say, God might have Corey to do that might differ from some of the good works he has for me to do. How do you kind of merge that from, like, independence versus 
you know, we're not involved in every single like good work collectively. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so there is a interdependence of the body of Christ and there is an other centeredness in the body of Christ. And, uh, you can take a look at yourself and how God's wired you and say, uh, I'm really made for this. And, you know, God has equipped me for it. These are the good works he wants me to do. Um, there are, I, I have a number of things that I could do, uh, and really well, but I don't do any of those things. I have given them up to be sub optimal in terms of utilizing my gifts and abilities so that I can be part of a body. Um, so you, you know, submitting yourselves to one another, lining up under one another, uh, considering others more important than yourself. Uh, my worth and value comes from the fact that I am obeying the uh, clear commands of scripture to limit myself for the benefit of others rather than obeying my design. Um, at one point I thought I'd be you know, a phenomenal assassin. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, my eyes weren't as good as they needed to be, but <laughs> fighting for truth and justice, uh, <laughs> as you might have heard someone's watching the Naval, Navy SEAL uh, show, say, I could be a Navy SEAL, except for the training. All right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, the hoplites in formation, that formation is more important than any individual skill. And you know, Jesus could have done numerous things by himself, but he spends the time walking three years on this earth with you know, 12 dummies. So yeah, you, you limit yourself and then God rewards you for that. He doesn't need you to do any of that stuff. We kind of confuse what we want to do with what God wants us to do. And there's nothing in the scriptures that says, Bill, do this. Well, until you become an elder and then it's got commands or if you become a believer and it's got commands. So, uh, yeah, you limit yourself for, uh, the sake of unity, just like Jesus did. He emptied himself of all his prerogatives and all his you know, glory to become a servant to these 12 guys who just didn't get it. Um, so it's, you know, that's kind of how you reconcile those things when, you know, George Mueller said, the first step in God's will is to have no will of your own. Yeah. So uh, I, I had been a phenomenal job offer. It would have taken me around the world and, you know, I'd be retired at 30. And uh, I, that wasn't what God wanted me to do because disciple making was more important. With working with imperfect people, very flawed people, and I'm talking about the <laughs> disciple makers, not the folks you're trying to minister to. Um, but that's what God wants. Uh, he places that as the highest priority. His glory is not so much in an in individual life. It's in the church. That's where it gets manifested. Are the we question. ever looking to support kind of those like good works that God might be at work prompting someone in though? Like, like with TBT, for example, a lot of people kind of contribute and help in that area. So yeah, you do want to, I mean, so there's, you're, one of the things about unity, it's supposed to be intent on one mind and one purpose of one accord. Uh, you have to work to get to that to determine what it is that God wants a body to do. Um, the, it was, so you have, just think about Paul, uniquely gifted, incredibly gifted, 14 years with Christ. And he, he could have done anything. You know, and, you know, <laughs> um, it was, God used a church i think it was Antioch, to send out paul and barnabas so god makes it clear to the body uh what gifts should be exercised it is not the individual that is satan exalting a person it's the body that comes and says we think you should do that um i was thinking about seminary and uh there are people in uh, the church where i was going that came up to me and said, uh, and they were in the leadership, uh, we think you should go to seminary. And you know, so God used them to guide me down there. Um, so yeah, it's, you support people in what God wants you to do. Um, 
Jesus Christ says, if you want to be great, you be the servant. And most people want to use their gifts and abilities to become great. Um, but Jesus said, if you want to be great, be the servant of all. The greatest is the servant of all. So helping others succeed is more important than individual success. Yeah. I was just going to uh, you had written a really great thing in uh, Daily Food Face. Uh, Romans chapter 12 was about the proper functioning of the body. So you have to be in union with Christ and doing his purpose. And then the individual members are all fitted together to accomplish that purpose. So that's where the independent interdependence comes in. And it's prideful thinking prevents proper functioning and service of others in the body because it fails to recognize that we are all interdependent members in the union of Christ. The whole, the whole explanation of Romans 12 is a good. Romans 12 on Daily Truth Face is yeah. uh, an elaboration on this. Yeah, and, and actually Ephesians 4, it's the same thing. Each person supplies their part, but they're supplying their part to contribute to the functioning of the whole body. And it's, it's you know, body thing. You see Paul, even after he had, you know, great success, he goes back and uh, submits to the, you know, runaway elders, I mean, apostles, you know, guys who ran away to uh, make sure that what he's doing is, you know, kosher in terms of what he teaches. Um, and then he comes back and reports to that. He actually submits to uh, the uh, body of elders at uh, Jerusalem who are afraid of what the Jews want him to do or, or how the Jews will feel. So that's what winds him up in the temple with Timothy and then they, you know, the Jews lie about him being there, and then he say, "Oh, he's uncircumcised, but he wasn't." And you know, that's actually what got Paul thrown into prison and sent to Caesar and executed, um, because he did that. So, you know, Paul would, would have been not. Uh, if I was in charge of things, I would say, you know, let, let's get get him out of here. Forget what the Jews think. But uh, you know, it's uh, God had plans and uh, it's impossible for you to miss the will of God um, if you are committed to being submitted the good rats to do um, and it is very easy to miss the will of God by having your will be God's will where is the big temptation to do your thing rather than God's thing now there are people who you know are basically cowards who uh, will just you know, hide behind. Oh well, you know, um, we have to do everything together. Uh, there are times that God makes it clear that uh, he, he wants you to do other things, but it's it's a team sport. Um, the only time you see in history that doesn't well, you see it a couple times. Athanasius, uh, if Athanasius, the world be against Athanasius. Athanasius be against the world, and Martin Luther. Um, you, you do see some people that God uses, but they're also what you don't see in history, unless you dig deeper, is the other people that are around them helping them. Lots of people were you know, supporting Martin Luther and what he was doing. Uh, lots of people were supporting uh, you know, John Newton uh, and Wilberforce and the slavery issue. So we don't see the whole picture. History just records the highlights, and we, we don't realize it's the, the principle is God uses the body to build the body. Okay, so the Ephesian church, this is, uh, any other one? There was another. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I say that a lot of people emphasize on church several evangelism, right? Versus actually unity, it seems like a lot more important. And maybe I should ask myself, how is the objective move of God? Like, how do I contribute to unity of the body? Right? Yeah, uni yeah the, 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 the major flaw of uh, the contemporary church is uh, they just haven't read Acts 2. The people focus on doing obeying God, and He adds to their body those who are being saved. And you know, the Great Awakening is a great example of that, um, where um, Chairman of the History Department at Dallas spent a lot of time studying, and he said people are trying to figure out, well, what's the method? How did it work? And he said it's just really a, a work, sovereign work of God. You know, God can call people to Himself uh, very, very easily. Just look at Billy Graham's Crusades. Uh, you know. I don't, I don't know how many millions of people accepted Christ. Um, was it 4% of them wound up in a church a year later? 
yeah, yeah, I was going to, I looked it up once and it's like, it's either two or 4%. Um, we're, yeah, so it's like all this effort goes into getting converts, but none of them become reproductive. And what's the mandate? Make converts or make disciples? Let's make disciples. And what do you see in the scriptures? You see so much about uh, building up the body. That's because it's the body of Christ. That's if you just the image I always have is that he is the head up in heaven and we are the, the physical part of him down on earth. And we've got to be connected to him following his agenda. And if everybody's doing that, there's peace. But people don't do that, so there's chaos. Most pastors hate their jobs. They really do. Um, I have been in that group as well. Um, because you know, you, you're just dealing with carnal Christians. And the average length of a time of a pastor in a pastorate is like just, just about a year. So the, the nice thing is you have a lot of free time because you can just use the same sermons at your next church and then your next church and your next church. Uh, there was a really fun chain letter about, uh, you know, I, I can't remember exactly how it worked, but uh, it was about you know, changing your pastors from one church to the other. And if you break this chain, something really bad will happen to you, like you'll get your original pastor back. Mm -hmm. right. But there are churches that do care for their pastors, and there are people that you know, love uh, their ministry. But anyone who is actually doing real ministry, it, it's a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. It is one of the, you know, that, that's where... The, you know, grand, the, the, what they call ground zero. It's uh, the epicenter of the of the of Satan's attacks. Okay, the Ephesian local church was created by God to bring Himself glory as believers walked worthy of their calling in truth-based unity and love. So He's glorified in the church as two twenty-one of Ephesians. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, and he says, "Take heed to yourselves." That's it. Take heed. Leaders need to do this. Believers need to do this. And the way you take heed is you evaluate why are you doing what you're doing? And is it pleasing to God? What outcome do you expect? And is God going to be pleased with it? Those are like, I've probably done some sermons on taking heed and there are some evaluative questions in there. But that's, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? What do you expect to have happen? Take heed to yourselves first and then to all the flock and all the elders I've seen on our local body who have gone down the tubes have failed to take heed to themselves when God has brought up issues in their lives. So God uses other people to communicate his will. Something I was kind of, uh, not astonished, but it was just highlighted in uh, Second Chronicles, is God used uh, unbelieving kings to try to protect uh, the kings of Judah that were doing good from from fighting, and they ignored that and they died. They got killed because God did send them against, just like He sent Nebuchadnezzar against to judge them. He was actually, you know, like one guy wanted to go attack Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh says, no, "My battle's not with you. Don't do that." And the guy insisted. He actually disguises himself to go into battle, and you know, an arrow gets him. Okay, take it to yourselves into the flock. So elders need to be their overseers. The Holy Spirit makes and raises up overseers people electing them uh you just need to look at the requirements for elders which uh, aren't noised about marks of godliness is the sermon in that 30 points um and uh yeah all right um okay take and the flock so it's really an overseer is like a governor um, and the task and the purpose for which you're an overseer is not to rule, but to shepherd, pasture, feed the church of God, which he purchased with his blood. Uh, in the praise time, someone prays the accountability relationships. They're kind of like mentoring relationships, uh, which can be used uh, incorrectly by a lot of the cultic kind of churches. But uh, there's probably a handful, uh, like five, maybe even six, if you have six fingers, uh, of things where you're told to submit to those who spoke the word of God to you. There's even one at 1 Corinthians 16 that you know most people never get to. Um, Hebrews 12, uh, 13 has a couple. Uh, there are others. Uh, there is a hierarchy within the body of Christ. And first, uh, Peter chapter 5 is, is big because the younger guys thought, oh, we don't need that. You know, and there's old buddy duddies. Um, it's, it, it, that's, God will honor people's faith and commitment to obey his word and if he 
you know, once you, you know, he's doing something else, he'll make that abundantly clear to everyone. Well, the reason they had to take heed to themselves and the flock is because Paul knows that after he left, uh, or his departure, he's going to be going to Rome, savage wolves will come in among you and are going to rip apart the flock. And even from among themselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things because of ego to draw away disciples after themselves. Ego got Satan in that trouble. He gets pe people in you know, the same way. So both from outside the flock and inside the flock, there are people who are trying to destroy the flock. Therefore, watch. Uh, and then for 32, as I commend you to God in the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Elders have to know the truth. Uh, they've got to know it well. Uh, like he told Timothy, uh, I told you to remain in Ephesus so you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. One of the things that Christ is going to uh, get on the case of the church of Pergamon is that they are tolerating false teaching. But most people can't recognize false teaching. Um, you know, I don't know where they, uh, they, they do oral traditions. They don't know the truth and they don't know it according to its context. Uh, so these were questions I had in my sermon back then. I, I don't know if in the sermon we addressed them. You can go listen to that on your own if you're glutton for punishment. But Ephesus was the best taught church in the New Testament. Um, does that ensure that Christ was pleased with it? He was not. Because they didn't emphasize their first love of each other. And as a result, if they did not change their mind about it. They were going to lose their witness. Okay, Our Enemy the Devil. Remember I talked about last week, uh, Your Adversary the Devil is a book that someone donated to the bookstore. So guys that during the time I was there could uh, at least have exposure to something that you didn't get in your courses. Uh, the devil and his demons seek to undermine God, glorifying unity through deception and lies. Things that are kept in the dark and things that are flatly not true, not based on reality and not based on truth. So, follow my brethren, be strong in the Lord, power his might, stand against the wiles of the devil, blah, blah, blah. We did that earlier. Uh, individual believer, obey the, put on the armor. Uh, they need to work on truth uh, and being dressed for battle or the beach. Yeah, most people are naked when it comes to, you know, they're just wearing a swimsuit. Uh, there's no armor and they are, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they need to be protected. Because uh, they are deceived in thinking that they are able to take on wolves on their own. Um, oh, okay, the formatting got a little messed up on this. Um, our responsibility is to use God's armor and draw on his strength to combat and stand in unity. So, stand in unity and combat Satan by, oh, this sounds familiar, learning the truth, living the truth, and loving others with the truth and you need to learn it before you can live it you need to live it before you have the credibility to love others with it our understanding and use of each piece of the armor must come first from paul's use of it in the previous verses of ephesians and then paul's theology in other books that he wrote and then you can go you know other places but uh, that's where it starts uh in the uh, ephesians he describes the truth about the nature of the body and how our beliefs and actions must be in, in accord with that corporate truth. Read chapter 4. Um, you know, gifted men are given to teach you to come to a certain level of maturity so you can still grow and not get taken in by Satan's lies. And then in order for the body to function, everybody's got to be connected to the lordship or the headship of Jesus Christ. And then you work together with the joints that are around you to make the body function. Uh, the question that you want to ask in studying this is, and also answer it, how, how does each piece of armor protect or defend against Satan's attempts to destroy unity? It's only when you understand that that you can then go to different applications for individual believers. Individual believers must act in accord with that understanding to accomplish God's purposes. Why the emphasis on standing? Because uh, if the church uh, is going to be attacked and fall apart, you have ruins. I had this great picture from when I first went to Europe of a church that was stone 
Uh, it was in kind of somewhere in France, I think, south of France. And it's just like it had the, the walls, but the, the, the back, everything looked like it had been bombed out. It was just like, it was hollow. There was nothing in it. And of course, it wasn't used as a church anymore. Okay, the first thing is the belt of the truth. You got to have that around you. Um, so stand there for having your uh, waist girded with truth. So, you know, right around your belly button, you've got uh, your basic uh, belt and the early armor went on top of it, in front and back, and swords and everything else. Skirt. Um, in Jesus, it says chapter 1, verse 13, you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is true of each of you. And notice the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit of promise. Then he goes on in the next verse 14 about he's the down payment of our inheritance. And it's a basic truth. So we all have that. But then we can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit and not be submitted to him or filled with him. Uh, 4.15, speaking the truth in love, we grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ. So, by believers in a body speaking the truth in accordance with what is in another's best interest, because they don't see it themselves, that causes the growth of the body into union with Christ. And it's in union with Christ where all the goodies are. And the thing that you really need to help people grow in is headship. Christ is your Lord, not yourself. Uh, you were taught, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, that the truth is in Jesus. And here's the, what the truth is that comes from Jesus. You put off the former conduct, which is the old man that grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Okay, just think about that. This comes first. Uh, the Spirit must give you enough motivation to be sick and tired of being sick and tired and decide you're not going to be the way you were. It's only then that you can be renewed. Does it sound like Romans 12, 1 and 2? Yeah. First, you got to put it off, that can submit, kill, kill the old, and then you can be renewed. If you don't, that old man, your worldly values and nature, are going to grow more and more according to your unsanctified desires that you don't aren't aware of. You think you're doing fine. You're not. So when God brings truth into your life, be it through the word or through other people, this is the context of the these guys right here. It's in this context. The context doesn't change. Go back and look it up. Then you can be renewed, and that renewal first starts in your mind, your values. Your, your ambitions, your thoughts about yourself and the way your world ought to be. Things that you've been told in your youth that just ain't true, even if you grew up in a church. Then you can put on the new man. Now, in this context originally, it is corporately, individuality. Yeah, that's the, that's the sin of this Ephesians church. Um, I'm a Jew. I'm a, uh, a Gentile. That's, that's gone. But that the new man is created according to God's purpose in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying. Next verse, right? See, 24, 25. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor because we're connected. We are members of one another. What should be going on in our mind is how does this influence benefit others? That's, that, that should be part of our philosophy of speech. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, that's verse 29, except that which is used for building up the other guy, um, that it may minister grace to the earth. I think that's it. So, not doing that is lying. We lie when we have Satan's view of the world affect our speech and what we say and do. Not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God needs to control so put away the lying. So a renewed person, one of the first things he tells, don't don't be Satan's spokesman. That causes dissension, disunity.
confusion, every evil thing, because Satan has an in for the person who has not gotten sanctified, is not connected to the head, and uh, is not doing truth speaking in love. I'm not a huge fan of uh, A.W. Pink. I read a couple of his books when I was uh, just a real new believer. I guess they were on some book uh, table that was free. And uh, he said, I don't know, I like this guy. Um, and then once I got down to the scriptures better, I, I, there's a lot of stuff he says that I don't like. But there is stuff that he says that's good. And this is one of the quotes. A.W. Pink states that Satan's chief aim is to estrange men's heart from God, to get you disconnected from the vine, to have you not be loving the Lord with all your heart, to cause distance between yourself and God. And he came upon that just looking at probably all the people who just don't you know, spend time with God. And they don't spend time with God because God doesn't give you what you want when you want it. So you don't like God. So you're estranged. You have this you know, relative relationship. <laughs> you, know, you see those relatives during the holidays and you kind of can't wait for them to be over. Uh, Satan's work consists of substituting his lies in place of divine truth. Uh, spiritual warfare occurs in the mind and it is the mental reckoning or reasoning that results in a choice between God's word and Satan's lie. Satan's lie is that God's keeping something good from you. He fans the desires that God put in you, and God has a plan for fulfilling them. But you basically usurp God and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to fulfill that now. Well, no, you're just believing Satan's lie that you have to do it. God will do it. Trust him. Although the time, we're, we're deceived. We may not recognize that the alternative offered is a lie or from Satan. And he's spot on in this. Spiritual warfare is actually an individual. Uh, Joyce Myers, who has some good things, but she's listed on the False Teachers in Jude in you know, the research that I uh, presented for you there. Uh, it's Battle for Your Mind, is I think the title of her book. And she's correct that it's what you think affects what you do. You need to examine what you think. You need to examine why... You want something. You need to examine what effect it has on others and see, is this something that God is going to be pleased with when you have to give him account? His word is going to lay out for you in this life uh, what's from God and what's not from God. What's the soul and what's the spirit? And it's going to, you know, Christ's light is going to totally reveal it in the future, so be forewarned now. Okay, the next one is righteousness. I'll just start this because time is not going to permit me to do it. But we got the same verse here. <laughs> uh, breastplate of righteousness. So you'd hook this on uh, to your belt. Uh, goes over the shoulders, patches in the back. So you're protected front and back. And uh, if you get wounded, it's just like going to be in, you know, an arm or a shoulder. Um, but it won't be fatal. Um, so righteousness is doing what's right in God's sight. This is a simple definition. The new man was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we throw holiness in there, uh, basically separation from the world. The fruit of the spirit, if the spirit of God is at work in your life, said Paul in Ephesians 5.19, consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. If the spirit's at work in your life, you're doing what's right in God's sight, Truth is spilling out when you speak, and you're doing it. You know, it's good. It's it's blessing others. It's you know, it's not going to um, do them harm. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Okay, so kids don't know what's going on, but they think they do. And like right now, you know, we have in our culture, uh, is it like first and second graders determining uh, what gender they should be? <laughs> Uh, unreal. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen this in history. Um, it's, this shows how demonic our culture has gotten. The kid thinks the parents hate them. Oh, I hate you, says the little toddler, when they can't do what they want. And, you know, parents are 
Well, yeah, you'll get it all grow it out. This is for your best interest. Um, but you know, there's it, it's it's for your benefit. Uh, James, this is the key verse of uh, spiritual warfare. Some God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. He's going to resist you if you're pursuing your ego enhancement, your specialness. Submit to God. Jesus didn't pursue his um, specialness. He took, emptied himself of that. Only then can you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Then after you're submitted to God, you can then draw near to him and he will draw near to you. He's not the hound of heaven who's going to pursue you and pursue you and pursue you. Until you repent, he doesn't relent. Until you take the steps towards him, then he will take steps towards you. He'll send you prophets. He'll send you truth that you don't want to hear to you know, reprove and bring you know, your sin. Uh, but uh, you need to take the step towards him. And then there's cleanup to do. Clean up your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. You need to do this. Uh, and then the people who talk about positional righteousness are just you know, doing Satan's work because, you know, they're saying, "Oh God, this is all. It happened at the cross. You're all like this, and by God's sight, that is demonic." Um, so as you know, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But you have to do it. You have to circumcise your heart, both in the Old Testament and now. Make yourself more sensitive to God. If you do that, you will be a vessel for honor. Uh, sanctified and useful to the master. God will use you for his purposes because you're prepared now for every good work. And then the next verse, you need to flee the youthful lust, the worldly lusts. But the thing you're going to chase after instead of your lust is righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Oh, with those who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. There's the body again. We're commanded to pursue God with like-minded believers. Major reason missionaries uh, leave the mission field, they can't get along with other missionaries. Really interesting. Okay, my time is up. Uh, any last burning questions? Just a comment about the Romans army. So if someone that is refused to change and sanctify and clean up yourself, then actually that person becomes the weakling of the church and don't he or she has to give account because he actually affecting other people, the church, to not only yourself. Yeah, so uh, in the passage we read in the Lord's Supper, I think it was, um, if you diminish the church, God will diminish you. Uh, because what you do affects others, and if it affects them negatively, uh, it would be better for a millstone to be hung around your neck and tossed into the sea. So yeah, it's like God is going to judge us, not just on the basis of the commands, but what effect we have had on others. First Corinthians 3, which we read earlier, said um, you're going to be rewarded according to the work you've done in building up others in the body. As you have the opportunity to do good to all men, the priority is the household of faith. Well, also you have no, if you're battling the body, mm -hmm. there's all the energy is spent battling within yourselves, which is what Paul was chastising yeah. Galatians, and, and he chastised almost every church for this, uh -huh. um, for, for their strife and envy and their dissensions, then you don't even, you have less uh, energy or resources to share God's glory with the world. And that is God, a Satan's strategy, to have the believers um, fight, fight against each other, and the ones who cause that, God will destroy. Um, yeah, it's, as, as Jude said, it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they knew it to depart from it. Because, you know, it's not, you're not going to go into the lake of fire, but you're going to have an eternity to regret your, uh, deceived dumbness. Oh, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you are very clear in your word about what you want and the power that you make available to us and the key to getting that power and the actions that you want us to take. Um, help us follow Christ's example in submitting ourselves wholeheartedly to your will. 
to loving you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. I pray for us as a body that we would pursue uh, righteousness and peace uh, with each other, uh, by, the, by the characteristics, uh, as we purify our hearts and become more pleasing in your sight, both as individuals and as a body. We commit ourselves to this task by your help and for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>